Our passage today includes one of the most, if not the most memorized verse in the whole Bible, John 3, 16, and for good reason. It says, for God so loved the world that he sent his one and only son, that whoever believe in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. What a beautiful verse, a beautiful truth, full of hope and power. And I'm really looking forward to unpacking that particular verse with you today. Uh, but we're going to get there to John 3.16 by setting that verse in the context of the broader passage that we're looking at today, uh, which is uh, John 3 verses 1 to 21. Uh, you, you're joining us today in the seventh uh, sermon in our series going through John's gospel, and we're in for an absolute treat. And before we read through this passage, let me just show you all the verses that we'll be looking through at once on, on one slide all together, just so you can see the structure. Uh, and don't worry, you don't need to read it now. Um, but you'll see that today's passage tells us the story of Jesus' interaction with a Pharisee named Nicodemus, um, we'll get, who um, we'll get to meet and who we'll see in just a, a moment. But look what happens when I highlight who is saying what in this um, passage. Now, I've put the bits that Nicodemus says in green and what Jesus says in red. Uh, can you see how this is a, a natural exchange between them? Uh, Nicodemus starts, Jesus answered, and we have that three times over. Uh, and for those uh, wondering, this is what the word count of those sections look like on a graph. And incidentally, I think this is a wonderful picture of what sanctification looks like. He must increase, we must decrease. And to help us through this passage today, I'm going to take each of these exchanges in turn. So verses 1 to 3, looking at being born again. Uh, verses 4 to 8, looking at being born of the Spirit. And verses 9 to 21, and this imperative to believe in the Son. So let's start by reading verses uh, 1 to 3 uh, together. So verses 1 to 3, let's read those. Now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. Jesus replied, very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. Uh, so here the scene is set for us. Uh, this man named Nicodemus has arrived to question Jesus. And we can pick up some really interesting details about who Nicodemus is from this passage. Verse 1, we're told that he is a, a Pharisee. This is a, a group of uh, religious, um, uh, a religious uh, sect within the wider Jewish religion at, in Jesus' day. They were known for their depths of understanding of the law and their commitment to keeping it down to the nth degree. They are committed people. At verse 1 as well, we're told he is a member of the Jew Jewish ruling council and he's seemingly given a title in verse 10, you are Israel's teacher, Jesus says of him. And he is a recurring character actually through John's gospel. This is the first time we meet him, but we're going to meet him again in John 7 and again then in John 19. He's a really compelling character and I can't wait to, for us to get to know him better as we go through this series. But verse 2 here tells us that he came to Jesus at night. Now this could be that Nicodemus was just finding it really hard to catch up with Jesus, you know, find a moment during the day. Jesus was a popular teacher, maybe lots of people around. Uh, but it does feel like there's a secretive suggestion to this detail, particularly given how this passage lands in verse, verses 19 and 21. So away from prying and spying eyes, Nicodemus arrives to question Jesus. And see what he says to Jesus. Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. Um, there is respect in this address to Jesus, as, he, as Nicodemus calls him Rabbi. But did you also clock the, we know that? I hear there's a bit of posturing, uh, maybe a bit of judgment, but there's also an implicit question that follows. He's, he's effectively saying, look, we, we know that no one could do these things that you're doing without God's power. Um, j just think back to the first sign that we looked at a, a few weeks ago, Jesus turning water into wine. These are the signs, they're miraculous things. And Nicodemus is basically saying, so, so help me understand why you are doing what you are doing. And Jesus replies in verse three, very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. 
Now, each of Jesus' reply to Nicodemus starts with this phrase, very truly, I tell you. And John is kind of using it for emphasis. It's like he's underlining Jesus' words for us. And, And Jesus says, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. And given Nicodemus' response to this in verse four, we know he has questions about this too. So it's worth, uh, worth us making sure that we know what Jesus is talking about and what he's saying too. So the phrase, the kingdom of God, is used frequently in the other three uh, gospels, so Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Uh, and John only uses it twice, both in the verses that we're exploring today. And, and the kingdom of God refers to God's saving rule. It's not just about something far flung in the future. Jesus' words carry an expectation that this is something that Nicodemus would see if he was to be born again. Now to a Jew with the conviction and background of Nicodemus, uh, to see the kingdom of God was to participate in the kingdom at the end of the age. Uh, So to experience eternal resurrection life. And it was generally expected that all Jews would be included in this kingdom by virtue of their heritage. I think there was a slight exception for those who were extraordinarily wicked or who had committed deliberate sin. So Nicodemus would have been shocked that Jesus is implying that his natural birth is not enough for him to see the kingdom of God. He must be born again. Now Jesus uses this phrase to be born again to introduce Nicodemus to the true spiritual nature of Christ's kingdom and see, um, see how initially that Nicodemus doesn't, doesn't get it. At verse four he says, how can someone be born when they are old? Nicodemus asked, surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. Yet now to me this feels a bit like crude humor from Nicodemus, but Jesus goes on to explain more. Verse five, Jesus answered, very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at me saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. Yet you hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. Let's see here how Jesus basically doubles down on his previous answer. He's saying you don't enter the kingdom because of your ancestry or your DNA. You can't enter the kingdom through attempting enough good works just to get in. So it's not through racial inheritance or circumcision or energetic law keeping, scriptural knowledge or acts of piety. You can only enter the kingdom of God if you are born of water and the spirit. Now there are some options in interpreting interpreting Jesus' phrase here, born of water and spirit. So so option one is that this is talking about natural birth and spiritual birth. So water's breaking before the natural birth and then the spirit being the the spiritual birth. Now option two is probably how we're tempted to read it within our theological tradition. So water being uh, baptism. So uh, baptism in water and then baptism of the Holy Spirit. But for me, more likely is actually uh, on, on, on option three. Um, and which sees the phrase of, of water and the spirit as referring to one thing rather than two. And it is unpacking what Jesus meant um, basically when he said, you must be born again in verse three. Now put yourself in Nicodemus's shoes and consider this conversation from his perspective and Jesus' desire to communicate something fundamental and new to Nicodemus. And I think it's unlikely then that Jesus would be using an obscure euphemism for childbirth or a description for a little known or sort of not yet existent ritual in baptism. Jesus assumes that Nicodemus should understand what he is saying based on his status as Israel's teacher. So given that Nicodemus would have taught from the Old Testament, including the prophets, I think Jesus is pointing Nicodemus to themes he expects the Pharisee to recognize. At verses like these three verses in Ezekiel 36. Now we're jumping into a a larger passage here, but God is basically sharing with Ezekiel and the people of Israel what the the new covenant is going uh, going to be like. The new covenant that Jesus in John 3 is proclaiming. 
But here in Ezekiel 36, verse 25 starts, I, I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all of your impurities and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. This promise in Ezekiel of the new covenant puts two pictures for us like together. Uh, that God would put his spirit in his people and that God would wash them clean with water. They're bringing them together. And this, uh, these new covenant people that Ezekiel then is talking about who will see the kingdom of God are born of both water and spirit. So I think Jesus here is not talking about uh, a need for us to be baptized here in John 3, although clearly there is a strong New Testament mandate for baptism. And neither is he speaking about the need to be filled with the Spirit, although he frequently does elsewhere. He is speaking about the fact that Nicodemus and all like him cannot simply rely on their heritage and their bloodline to enable them to see the kingdom of God. They must experience this renewal of the heart, this rebirth, this cleansing and transformation that these come through the promised new covenant. And before we move on, let's just pick up a small detail that Jesus gives in verse 8, where he says, The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. Now, this illustration is a natural one for Jesus to use. Uh, the words the Israelites use to describe the God's Spirit that we see throughout the Old Testament is ruach. And it's a Hebrew word that literally means wind. And today we can predict more clearly where the wind will blow than they could in Nicodemus' day, but we're no closer to controlling its direction or force. And I think therefore it's an apt metaphor for the Spirit's work. It's beyond human control or manipulation. That This new birth that Jesus is talking about is supernatural. Nicodemus' third contribution here is his shortest by a long way. And it, to be honest, it's the best question that he could have asked. How can this be? How can God renew his people in this way? How can we be born again? If it's not through who we are, if it's not through what we do, how can this be? How can we be born again? And I'm so glad he asked this question because Jesus gives this amazing answer so let's follow these verses through together. I'm going to pause along the way just to unpack some of Jesus' answer. So verse 9, how can this be, Nicodemus asked. You are Israel's teacher, Jesus said, and do you not understand these things? Very truly I tell you, we speak of what we know and we testify to what we have seen. But still, you people do not accept our testimony. Now I have spoken to you of earthly things and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Uh, here in verse 11 where Jesus says, we speak of what we know, uh, this is a direct callback to Nicodemus, Nicodemus' boastful we in verse 2. And against this partial and fluctuating views of the current Jewish teachers, Jesus, on the other hand, is speaking about the eternal truth of God with the authority of having seen these heavenly things himself. Verse 14, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. Now these verses are drawing our attention to Numbers 21 verses 4 to 9 in the Old Testament. And those verses tell the story of this moment where Moses lifts up a snake in a wilderness. And if we don't know that context, I mean what Jesus is talking about here in verses 14 and 15 is just a bit of a mystery to us. So let me read those uh, verses uh, to you now. So uh, Numbers 21 verses uh, 4 to 9. So the people of the Israelites have, um, the people of God have just been released from Egypt. They're wandering uh, through uh, the desert and we get to this point in their story. And they, they traveled from Mount Hor along the road to the Red Sea to go around Edom. But the people grew impatient on the way. 
They spoke against God and against Moses and said, Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? There is no bread, there is no water, and we detest this miserable food. Uh, Then the Lord sent venomous snakes amongst them. They bit the people and many Israelites died. Uh, The people came to Moses and said, We sinned when we spoke against the Lord and against you. Pray that the Lord will take the snakes away from us. So Moses prayed for the people. The Lord said to Moses, Make a snake and put it on a pole. Anyone who was bitten can look at it and live. So Moses made a bronze snake and put it up on a pole. Then then when anyone was bitten by a snake and looked at the bronze snake, they lived. Here in Numbers 21, uh, the Israelites are guilty of complaining against God. uh, And so the Lord rightly sends snakes upon them as a just judgment for their sin. Uh, When the people beg Moses to pray to God for uh, to, to take away the snakes, God actually refuses, but instead makes a different way out. God instructs Moses to make a, this a bronze snake, which is held up on a, a pole. And when the Israelites who are afflicted due to their rebellion and judgment of God, when they look to this serpent, they are healed. And to this day, a snake on a pole from Numbers 21 is the symbol of many healthcare organizations around the world. This story from the desert can sound odd to our modern ears, but they contain important truths for us about our sin, Our our sin are the wrong things that we do against God and against others through our thoughts, our words, and our deeds. And the way that they are described here in this passage, that they are like the snake's poison, killing us from the inside out. Infected in in our blood, we are in need of rescue. They're they're not just things that we can chalk up on a board. No, they're, they're poisoning us. They're killing us. Sin is deadly. But also we learn about salvation. That God has made a way for us. And it's about looking towards him for his healing and salvation. And Jesus wants us to see this comparison of what happened in the desert with what will happen to him. Verse 14, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the son of man must be lifted up. Now this lifted up in typical John style can actually have two meanings. It it could be like Jesus' crucifixion as he's lifted up on the cross to take the penalty for our sins. And And it's also when he is exalted in heaven after his resurrection. The Son of Man is lifted up. And John will play with this double meaning in future mentions of this, the Son of Man would be lifted up. So he'll talk about it in future chapters too. And whichever one you kind of want to primarily keep in mind, if you find it hard to have both of these in mind at once, and whichever, I think Jesus' point is clear. If you, want, if you want to live, if you want to have life, look to him. And when you do, verse 15, everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. And so we arrive at John 3.16, this most memorized and probably most often preached verse in the Bible. For God so loved the world that he sent his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Now let's unpack this verse together. Let's savor it together just a chunk at a time. It's a masterly and moving summary of the gospel, cast in terms of God's love for us. For God. I love the way this verse starts. For God, it's his initiative. He starts it. This, this is his idea. Uh, God sees us in our mess and thinks, I, I need to do something about this. For God. So loved. So loved. Uh, we can often talk about this uh, verse, this so, meaning like a, this quantitative thing. You know, he, so, there's so much of it. It's It's vast. But actually the so used here is not in that vast sense. It's, it's using so in the, in the same way as. So this verse is pointing us, uh, this word here, the so, is pointing us back to this verse 15. Just as Moses lift the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. For God so loved. In the same way as that lifting up. For God so loved the world. This world, with all of its mess, 
God has not abandoned us in it. Now, I don't know where in the world you're watching this. Um, here in, in the UK, I know our media is full of stories of trouble in this world. Um, so much of our faith in institutions, people, leaders, events, they're, they're shaken. Um, COVID has affected all of us. This is, a, this is a hard time. The world seems like it's in frustration and groaning. It's, it's, it seems so evident for us to see. But God so loved the world, this world, with all of its mess, with all of its people, us. God loves this world. And he's not abandoned us, but he gave his one and only son. He gave his one and only son. What a gift. What a gift. God gives that which is most precious to him, his son, and he gives it to the world. Why? That whoever believes in him, that whoever believes in him. Did you clock that? Whoever, who, whoever, whoever. Like it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter your background. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter how much you have. It doesn't matter your qualifications, your personality. No, whoever. Whoever you are, there, there is no barrier to you entering the kingdom of God. There's no DNA that you needed to have, you know, if you don't have it and you're like, oh, I'm stuffed. I'm not Jewish. I can't do it. No, no. Whoever, whoever believes, believes. It's this act of faith, this putting trust. And um, not that this believing is a work in itself. No, it's believing the work of someone else. It's about putting our trust in Jesus. That's all we need to do. Acknowledging, yeah, he's, you know, he's done it for me. Whoever believes in him shall not perish. Shall not perish. Now this, this is sobering because this is your fate if you don't believe. But that's not God's desire for you. He wants you to have eternal life. This verse says that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. That's God's heart for you. He wants you to live. He wants you to have life. Life that lasts through death into eternity. Eternal life, not just this uh, ticket that we hold on to that will win us heaven at the end of our time. No, no. Eternal life is a quality of life that we get now. As soon as you believe in Jesus, you have eternal life that lasts through death. Even death cannot take it from you or defeat it from you. It's, it's what is for now and what is to come. What a beautiful verse. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Verse 17, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but to save the world through him. Jesus' mission was one of salvation. Jesus came into an already lost and condemned world he did not come into a neutral world in order to save some and condemn others. He came into a lost world to save some. Jesus didn't come to condemn the world. The world already stood condemned before Jesus' arrival because of its sin. Jesus came to deliver people from their sin and to bring sinners back to God. And so there is a choice before each of us. Verse 18, whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God, the name of God's one and only son. Now this is a sobering verse. Like the Israelites with poison running through their veins, people need salvation. Whoever refuses to believe in the son is already condemned. The poison's already there. And by not believing in the Son, they compound their own guilt. There is a choice before each of us, and it's a decision that we all need to make. Are you going to step into the light or not? Our passage finishes with verses 19 to 21. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. 
There is a choice before each of us. Are you going to step into the light or not? Uh, Nicodemus is a model for us in this passage. Someone who is stepping out of the darkness to approach Jesus. Remember, he came at night to approach Jesus. Came out of the darkness of light to approach Jesus, the light of the world. How are you going to respond to Jesus? Our natural disposition is to love darkness. These verses tell us that that is because our deeds are evil. That we fear that these evil deeds will be exposed in the light. And if you have never come to Jesus before, perhaps this is the day. Make a choice to step out of your darkness and into the light. Look to Jesus and be healed. Look to Jesus who paid the penalty for your evil deeds and know his restoration and forgiveness. And if you're listening to this and you already follow Jesus, I think that there are two quick challenges that I want to just lay before you. Are there areas of your life that you are keeping in darkness? Verse 21 says, whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what you have done has been done in the sight of God. You know that there is nothing hidden from God's sight. So as we take time to respond to this message in these verses, this passage, in the rest of our service, why don't you take time to deliberately step into the light again, that Christ may shine his light on you. And my second challenge, are there, are there people today that you can share this message of hope with? That the light has come into the world. We no longer have to live in darkness. Who could you share this message of hope with today? Let, let me close in prayer. Father, thank you for sending your son Jesus into the world to save the world. Thank you that you have not left us in our darkness, but you have made a way for us to step into your light. Help us to do that today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. May you know God's blessing today.